Good evening. Great job, Weston. Thank you for that. So good to be back. And I want to thank you as a congregation for being such a strong support for our children. Um, Man, they know that you're there and you have their back. And that's really important in the kingdom of God that we make sure that they are a part of the kingdom of God. Right? It's not that God didn't develop the body to be a concept of we separate out our children in doing their own thing. No, they are a part of us. This is Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. It's so biblical, isn't it? Our children are a part of the body. And uh, in, in the sense of they are growing up to be a part of that. And uh, we expect them to be Christians just like us. And so thank you so much for supporting them and supporting our kingdom kids participating and things like that and congratulating them afterwards um, that's stuff that they'll never forget the encouragement of the brothers and sisters that they have around them that's a really important thing for the kingdom tonight I want us to continue in what we started last week and that is looking at the uh, the satisfied life living the satisfied life do you know that right here right now you and I we get to live the satisfied life But the only way to do that really is that we live the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's critical that we study often this grand, majestic sermon found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's just crucial that we do. And then, of course, maybe even more crucial is that we obey the last part of it that we will eventually get to if the Lord allows us to do so. And that is that those of us who hear these words, we're going to be the wise man who builds his house on the rock, who listens to these words, and we do them, and our house, our life will be satisfied and grounded and stable because we are living the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So we're in Matthew 5 and verse 4 tonight. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted how can i live the satisfied life and live a life of mourning some someone once said or there's at least a proverb that says that all sunshine makes a desert by the way we just haven't had quite enough sunshine lately Don't you, I mean, when you wake up and you're like, oh, again? You just want it to be bright and sunny out, right? I love it that it was a little bit that way today. But, um, man, we love when there's sun, but we can't have sun all the time. Sometimes there has to be rain. Sometimes there has to be tears, right? The question is, who knew, though? Who knew that morning could bring blessings because he says blessings to satisfaction to the man to the one who mourns who who knew jesus knows you see true satisfaction will come only to those who choose to live by these words spoken in this powerful powerful sermon and so tonight let's just Let's look at it as we go through those who mourn, what does it mean? What does it mean? Okay, to mourn and to weep, those words were oftentimes used together in the Bible. The Greek word for mourn, uh, pentheo or pantheo, is actually the strongest word for mourning in the Greek language. It is used for mourning for the dead, that is expressing passionate lament for those who are loved ones who have passed on this would be the word used right here in the septuagint which is um, the greek translation of the hebrew bible in the in the septuagint jacob's grief this word is actually found for jacob's grief losing joseph in genesis 23 and verse 2 so it's a very passionate lament for losing someone it's actually the kind of sorrow that grips a person and will not let him or her go 
it not only brings an ache to the heart, but it just naturally brings a tear to the eyes. So mourn, a passionate lament, and then he shall be comforted. The word comfort means to call to one side. It's one of the para words. To go beside, to call to one side. Listen now. At the amazing paradoxical bliss that is found with the one who mourns, it could be said this way. Oh, the bliss of the man who mourns like one mourning for the dead, God will be called to his side. He will be comforted. To be called to the side, to one side. But the natural question, I think that we usually all ask, is, is mourn what? I mean, what, what is it that we are to mourn? There's three basic answers that most scholars turn to, and, and I'll point out the one here in just a little bit of what I, I believe that it's actually saying within its context. But mourn what? I think the first one would be to mourn, it, it would, might bring the idea of mourning the loss of loved ones, the sorrow of others. That, that might be it. And if so, I would accept that because it hurts, doesn't it? It actually does hurt to mourn the one that you love so dear and so close to you. And man, it comes from our deep care and compassion and love, sincere love that we have for that person. And so it would make sense that we would be comforted when we lose someone, we mourn for the loss of that. That's one possibility. The second possibility would be to mourn the sin and wickedness that's in the world. Someone would, might, call this righteous, might call this righteous mourners then. To mourn the, the sin and the wickedness that's found in this world. And boy, couldn't we do that. I mean, I, I just wonder sometimes if it's just better that I just stay away from all the headlines. It just, sometimes it would just be better for me not to know that that's going on out there. We live in such a sinful world. But you know what? This was the history of the prophets. They were sent, weren't they, into a sinful world. Isaiah 61 tells of, of a Messiah who would comfort all of those who would mourn in this sinful world. Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, this is repeated in Luke 4, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn. Jeremiah was that prophet, wasn't he? What do, what do we call him, church? That's right, the weeping prophet. He is the one who penned the words in lamentations to lament. Lamenting due to Israel's or Ju uh, Jerusalem's destruction because of the sin of God's people. That's what that book is all about. So that's a possibility to mourn uh, sin and wickedness found in our world. And then there's a third one, and that is to mourn our own sins. These are usually the main uh, possibilities that are given. To mourn our own sins is the third one. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, for, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. We ought to have the sorrow that's according to the will of God, and that sorrow ought to be toward our own sin that produces repentance, right? Leading us to salvation. Only when one comes, truly comes to God with a broken heart, is he a candidate for conversion. Have you thought about this? Let me say that again. Only when one comes to God with a broken heart, is he a candidate for true conversion. 
What, don't we question that with people sometimes? Someone who's obeyed the gospel, putting Christ on in baptism. And we don't see much of a change there, right? I mean, it's like, are you any different? Are you concerned about your old way of life at all? And the consequences and putting those things off and continuing to repent of those things? Well, we, we should be. That comes from having a broken heart. David had that broken heart. Go over to Psalm 51. We reference it a lot, but I just want to read the whole Psalm. Psalm 51. It's a Psalm of David. When the prophet Nathan came to him, you remember, after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Most scholars would say that it was around 18 months before Nathan addressed this with David. I don't know exactly, but he had to have a broken heart. And listen to what he wrote. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. That's not a, this isn't a good translation for that verse, but anyway, yours is probably better there. He goes on to say, sinful from the time that my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts, and you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. You, you know, when you live in sin, when a person lives in sin, you, you actually lose your true joy and gladness. It's only when one is broken and comes back with a broken heart that joy and gladness comes. Doesn't that sound like this uh, beatitude right here? Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Hide your face from my sins, verse 9, and blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to, to delight you, and then bulls will be offered on your altar. That's one who's mourning his own sins. And so that brings us tonight to this next part. How do I practice this then? And I, and I mean, of course, in a, no doubt Jesus means it as well. In a sincere way, how do I practice being one who mourns? Well, if we were to go with the first meaning that, that we talked about uh, just a while ago, and that is mourning the loss of loved ones and the sorrow of others. I guess you could translate this, um, th the words of Jesus like this, Oh, the joy of the one who is moved by the loss and the sorrow of a loved one, for he shall be comforted by God. We have a great example of Jesus with his friend Lazarus, don't we? Doing this very thing, mourning over his loss. Jesus was 100% human and 100% God at the same time. And so that idea would bring us the blessings that we find um, when we are comforted. We receive the comfort from a compassionate God. But if we apply it to meaning number two, it might go like this. Oh, the joy for one who is moved and hurt 
by the wickedness in this world, for he shall be comforted by God. Well, that would be all together appropriate because sin isn't funny. And the, and the pleasures of sin we've learned from Moses only last for a season, right? The passing pleasures of sin, Hebrews chapter 11 says. Sin, dis- it's not funny, it destroys. Sin divides how, how many families are being divided right now because of some, one person choosing a sinful life? It kills the soul. It divides. Sin is the prelude to eternal destruction. And so that would make sense. But I really think, here's what I want to present to you tonight. I really think that it applies to the third meaning. I think context tells us that. So for that third meaning, and that is one who mourns his own sin, I guess we could say it this way. Oh, the joy for, for the one who is desperately sorrow, sorrow for, or sorrow, sorry for his own sin and unworthiness, for he shall be comforted by God. It's a sorrow that David had. It's a sorrow that Paul had when he calls himself the chief of sinners or oh, wretched man that I am. He was sorry about his sin. When one in the Old Testament was sorry about their sin, you could physically see it, couldn't you? As they would tear their clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and sit for days and mourn their sin. You know, John, the immerser, and Jesus, their first message was repentance. Repent. But repentance doesn't come without sorrow. True repentance. Do you consider yourself a person... A penitent person? Someone might say a repentant person. You consider yourself that? Because I don't think you really can be that without sorrow for your sin. Otherwise, you're just doing it to do it. You're just doing it because you know it's right to do. David didn't, I don't think he just wrote that psalm because it was the right thing to do and it would be read years later. He had a deep sorrow for his sin. Do you? Do I? I mean, do I mourn it? Do I just regret it for a minute or two and then walk away like it never happened? Or do I mourn my sins? I think within this context of being poor in spirit, being pure in heart, seeking righteousness, being meek, all these things, I almost feel like it has to be this this meaning. I don't think he would just break in here and go, and by the way, God will be with you when you are sorrowful for the ones you lose. I appreciate that. And I... I think we are comforted by God when we, as Christians, have sorrow for the ones we lose. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying, though. I don't really think he's saying, blessed are you who get upset and shed tears because of the sin of others. I think he does comfort us. And by the way, I think we should be upset and have sorrow over the sin and wickedness of our community of our nation of our world we should be that but this is an internal look the beatitudes are about your attitude right church and it just seems to me that if we want to practice mourning we do it with ourselves and i mourn my sin Because true repentance is not without 
true sorrow. And it seems to me that this is what the cross is really all about. It seems to me that we get a chance every single week, praise God, to come and do a little bit of mourning, a whole lot of praising, a whole lot of thanksgiving, but also a little bit of mourning. Maybe at some points in our life, a whole lot of mourning for our sins and what it did to Jesus. Do you know Do you know that he went on the cross for your sins? Yours. Like the sins you committed this week, he died for those. When you think back of the, something terrible you've done, something that you may even be paying for right now, Christ died for that. That's what's so, I hate that, this isn't a good word. That's so what, what's so weird about Christianity, though, is that we can have so much joy and mourning all in the same package for what Christ has done for us. There's a bunch of joy in the cross and a bunch of sorrow in the cross all at once. When a man sees sin for what it really is and what it really does, He can't help but be sorrowful. Christianity begins with a sense of sin. It's why you and I need a Savior. It's why you and I need grace tonight. It's why he died for you. Because of your sin. And one who is brokenhearted over his sin... will find true joy because he will be comforted. So the next time you sin against God, and I suppose that could be soon, I encourage you to read Psalm 51 and then talk to him about the things that David writes about. I've mentioned to you before, especially in a Wednesday night class, that you ought to practice praying through Scripture. The idea would be, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Father, I'm asking for that mercy right now. And I'm praising you because of your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Father, you know I've sinned against you. I just pray that you blot my transgression out. That's the, that's the concept. Pray through Psalm 51. And let it bring mourning to your life. And praise God tonight that we don't have to live in a state of mourning. Because we shall be comforted by the God who sent his son Jesus to die for us. And we get to receive all the blessings and all the joy that that brings. Praise God tonight. Blessed are those who mourn, for God will come in beside them. And when he does, he reminds you, that's why I sent my son to die for you. That's why I sent him. If we can help you with your sin tonight, let us do so as we stand and as we sing together.